Greetings, Microscopist. I was at M&M for all five days this year, and I saw a lot of things and spoke with a lot of people. So I have a few things I wanted to share with all of you. I'm sorry if this will be a little long and or boring, but science. So overall, the show was pretty good. I don't have the actual numbers, but it appears the attendance was down a bit from pre-COVID numbers, which is to be expected. Some vendors said things were very good, while others were a bit more mediocre. Nobody I spoke with uh, said it was a disaster. I was able to get some interviews with some of the vendors, and I'll start posting them as soon as I'm able to get them edited. I think I did about a dozen of them, so stay tuned for those. All the major microscope manufacturers were there, and many of them were employing some strong money-saving techniques. Thermo Fisher, for example, had zero instruments in their booth or anywhere on the show floor. Zeiss had no instruments present in their booth, but they did have a Sigma 500 VP in the Oxford booth. They also had two remote microscope stations where people could watch an instrument being operated remotely and speak with the operator. Uh, they also were baking fresh chocolate chip cookies in their booth, which were pretty good, so there was that. TestScan had a similar approach. They had one remote microscope station, a Clara SEM in their booth, and a mock-up of their new TEM, the Tensor. Only JEOL and Hitachi really came with a lot of instruments. Hitachi had an SU-8700, SU-3900, and an ion mill in their booth, with an HT-7800 in the AMT booth, and the SU-5000 in the Oxford booth, and a TM-4000 tabletop in the Mega booth. JUL had the same number of instruments with a JEM-1400 Flash, IT-200, IT-700HR, IT-800, and a tabletop all in their booth. Uh, they might have had an ion mill there too, but if they did, I didn't write it down. For those of you who don't know, bringing any instrument to a show like this is extraordinarily expensive. The vendors uh, already have the huge costs of purchasing the booth space, advertising, 20 or 30 plane tickets, hotel rooms, and all the related expenses for all of those people. And then to pack up one SEM or TEM, ship it across the country, install it, deinstall it, ship it back, and then reinstall it is crazy pants expensive. I mean, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And then multiply that number, whatever it is, by four, which are the number of major instruments both Hitachi and Joel brought to this show, and it becomes very understandable why the other three manufacturers really cut back on the actual instrument presence. I can't say that Thermo Test Scan and Zeiss booths were fairly slow after the first day, but the Joel booth was fairly busy most of the time, and I did see Hitachi giving live demos right up until the show floor closed on Thursday. So was the juice worth the squeeze? That's the question all of these companies are constantly asking themselves. My thinking is that while remote demos are better than nothing, they are not the same as actually sitting down at the instrument and watching somebody use it or using it yourself. That tangible experience can't be substituted, which is why I say to everyone looking to buy an electron microscope, the one thing you always, always need to do is to get an in-person sit-down demo before you buy. Always. Anyway, I also wanted to talk specifically about a few products I saw there and people I spoke with separately from the interviews that I did. Probably the biggest product news from this show, uh, in my opinion, is the new Oxford detector. It's called the Unity, and it introduces a new technique called BEX, and I think it's pretty interesting. I did get a quick interview with Oxford about this, and I will be posting it in the next week or two, but I'll give you my honest and complete opinion here. To do that, I'm going to have to start with a little background info. I could be wrong on these dates, but I think around six years ago, uh, Bruker released the Flat Quad, which is an EDS detector that comes into the chamber parallel to the ground and has four 15 millimeter detectors sitting directly above your sample. Now, this has some incredible benefits for data collection. First off, you get millions of counts per second with this. Their brochure says up to four million, since the detector is much closer to your sample and also completely surrounding your sample. This means you can get a statistically relevant number of counts in a map to do reliable quantification analysis that won't take you a week to collect. The other really great thing is that because the detector is right over the sample, there are no shadows in the map. You can actually get EDS data out of a hole. Lastly, let's say you had a very beam sensitive sample. You can severely restrict the current hitting the sample and still get what would otherwise be considered to be a normal number of counts. 
So it has some very unique benefits to it. It also has a few downsides. First is that with it inserted, you can't use your backscatter detector because it goes where the BSE should be, or at the very least, it will block its view of the sample. Second, the flat quad is sort of a windowless detector, kind of. The sensor is not sealed separately from the SEM chamber as most EDS detectors are. So I think it might be possible to have some condensation issues on it if you vent the SEM chamber too quickly before it warms up. I might be wrong about that, but that sounds uh, possible to me. So while the detectors are not sealed, uh, they do have a filter thing that sits in between them and the sample. The downside with that is that you need to make sure you position the correct filter over the detector based on what voltage you're using. So if you're using between one and five kV, there's no filter and it's basically windowless. But between six and 10 kV, you need to have a thin window inserted and from 11 to 15 kV, there's a thick window that needs to be inserted. Now I could be wrong about this, but I think the max voltage you can use on the flat quad is 15 kV. And I might be wrong about that. It might be 20 kV, but my recollection is, is 15 and they don't state it on their brochure. So someone please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Basically, you have to be careful with what voltage you're using and which window you have inserted, or you could potentially damage the sensors. Anyway, the other minor bummer is that this is a specialty detector, which means that you still need a regular EDS detector to do regular EDS things. Now, I'm not sure about this, but I think you cannot use both detectors at the same time. You have to retract one and then insert the other. Anyway, if I'm wrong about that, someone please correct me. So this is the playing field that we're on when Oxford comes out and drops this Unity detector. Uh, and Oxford will say that the Unity is not a competitor to the flat quad because it does things the flat quad cannot do. Now that's a good marketing pitch, which has some truth in it. But because of the obvious similarities between the two, everyone is going to compare them no matter what. So let's do that now. So what is the Unity and what is BEX? The Unity is a detector that comes in from the side of the chamber and sits directly over the sample. However, as we can see from this fancy looking head design, these two circles are the active EDS detection areas. And these two swoopy looking shapes here are actually BSE detectors. So BEX means backscattered electron and X-ray. So just like the Bruker flat quad, the Oxford Unity can get the insane counts, the shadowless maps, and do the low voltage analysis on beam sensitive samples. But it can also show you a live BSE image at the same time. This ties in directly with the Aztec Live feature in their software. Oxford is the only EDS manufacturer with an actual live EDS view in their software, which means you can move the stage around and you can see a live EDS map. And no, the Thermal Color Sem does not compete in this area because number one, it's not live. It only runs while the stage is not moving. And number two, it's not a reliable data collection tool. Thermo themselves market it only as a quick colorization tool, not an analysis tool. You have to read the fine print on that. So if you're using ColorSem to get data, stop it, do it the right way. <laughs> But back to the Unity, if you're looking for something specific on your sample, you can just move the stage around and see a live EDS and a live BSE image simultaneously in the Aztec software. I think that's great and all, and Oxford is the only company who can do that, so I don't want to diminish it, but I don't think that that will be the major draw for this detector. What I think uh, the major draw will be is another software option that they mentioned to me called cartography. This is basically a type of montage imaging that will be very fast and include not just EDS, but also BSE data. I think I might get some more specific info on that in my interview, so watch for that when it comes out. So what numbers can I give you on this? Well, it is very, very new. So their brochure is properly vague about everything. There's nothing that states the detector sizes or the count rate or the energy resolution or anything, but I was able to get a few details at the show. Because there are two BSE segments, you can view the sample in topo mode by turning one of them off. Both of the EDS detectors have filters on them, but they are limited to 20 kV. Uh, it can operate in low vacuum or with a cryo stage. The head section 
uh, on its own is replaceable if it gets damaged, which is good. You may also have noticed the funny shape of the head and it is not for aesthetic purposes. This little dip in the top here is so a normal EDS detector can fit in there and operate with it at the same time. So how much will it cost? Just the detector with no software, they said at the show, would cost around 35 to 40,000 euros which is about 35 to 40,000 US dollars. Now, as I said, this is brand new and I'm not sure if those prices will actually materialize or not, but if they do, that is not bad. If you already have an Oxford system and you wanna do ultra fast mapping of entire samples, like for particle analysis or something, this would be a solid upgrade for your system. Otherwise, I think it does show some definite benefits over the older Bruker flat quad. We'll just have to wait and see how it does, but I think it's going to be very popular. So that was the big one, but I did see some other interesting things. JH Technologies is importing the COSIM tabletop SEMs from South Korea. I do not have any experience with them, nor do I know anyone who does, but on paper, they're very impressive for a tabletop system. Well, they just got a new model in that is going to turn some heads. It's so new, I don't see it on their website yet. I think it's called the EM40, uh, but that info will be in the interview that I did with them, uh, so stay tuned. Anyway, this new model is special because it can accept a Bruker EBSD system, uh, a tabletop SEM with EBSD. I believe this is unique. The SEM will cost, I don't know exactly, but it's below $100,000, maybe 70 or 80, I don't know. But the EBSD system is going to cost you around 200K, give or take. So that does seem like a lot of money to sink into a tabletop SEM, so why would you want to do this? Uh, this would appeal mainly to two groups of people. First would be people who are primarily interested in doing EBSD work and don't have much else for their SEM to do. In that case, why buy a full SEM for twice or three times the price uh, if you're not going to use it. The second group would just be people who are poor and just really need to do EBSD. Anyway, I don't know anything about the reliability or the performance of the system, but this is a pretty cool innovation. Another interesting thing I saw was from Quantum Design out of San Diego. They had built their own tabletop SEM and combined it with an AFM. Now, there are other companies that make an AFM that will fit inside your existing AFM, uh, SEM, but this is an all-in-one solution that is not very large and plugs into a normal 110 outlet. I did an interview with the owner, so stay tuned for that, but this is kind of a, in a similar vein to the COSEM with the EBSD. If your primary interest is AFM, but you want to also get some correlative SEM data, you can do it with this system. This is mostly an AFM with a small SEM attached to it, uh, but I thought it was pretty cool. Connectom X from the UK had a very nice little package called the Katana Microtome. This is a very nice little instrument that will fit on most SEM stages and has a single feed through. It will slice through your block face and you can image each new face as it is revealed. This runs around 90K US and I would take it any day over the other major systems that this thing competes with. It is small, it is simple, I am on board. Thea Scientific out of Arlington, Virginia has some really impressive looking software which will do live particle analysis. So instead of collecting a bunch of images, however long that may take, an hour, a week, a month, whatever, and then processing it in another piece of software, their software will literally do it live on the screen. No need to manually select your features, it just does it and it counts. Um, it was really impressive stuff, and I did do have an interview with them also, so stay tuned for that. But if you're going to be doing any particle counting applications, I would definitely give them a call just to take a look at what they're offering. This last thing is kind of weird. It's either going to completely implode on itself and disappear, or it will utterly change the face of electron microscopy, and I don't know which one it will be. <laughs> <laughs> there were some guys from Pano Scientific out of Florida with a really crazy product which they call compressed sensing. My understanding may be a little flimsy, but from what I could gather, this is a hardware and software solution that allows an SEM or scanning TEM or even AFM to scan a very, very fast, very low signal image and then instantly reconstruct the remaining 80 or 90% of that image. 
You can read a bit more about it on their website and see a few examples. They're kind of tight on details as some of the patents are still being worked out. So my understanding of it is, is definitely fuzzy. Um, still, uh, even if they told me the whole spiel, I'm sure I, I probably wouldn't have been able to understand how it works anyway. It's so weird. If it actually does what it's claiming to do, it's pretty incredible and would completely change the game in acquiring large data sets for things like particle analysis. Instead of spending two minutes at each image location while making a montage, you may spend only 10 seconds. This could speed up the process so that instead of taking a few random images across a sample, you could take a montage image of the entire sample in the same amount of time. Or you could image samples that are extremely beam sensitive by only using these specialized, very fast scans. Anyway, Pano Scientific was putting out very strong signals that they want to sell this technology, either license it to any interested manufacturer, which, if it works, will be all of them, or to sell it exclusively to one company. Uh, so we will see what happens with that. If this technology is real, then all of the major electron microscope manufacturers will likely be fighting over it. But I just don't know. It may not work as well as advertised, or there may be some hidden problems with it that just aren't known yet. I just don't know. Uh, I do hope it works because it looks pretty cool. Anyway, sorry for the long, boring video, but if you missed out on Eminem this year, I thought you might be interested to hear about a few of these uh, new interesting things. Anyway, subscribe and click the bell to be alerted when my much shorter interviews drop in the near future. Thanks, we'll see you next time.